initiative that emerged from work that began several years ago in connection with the Ebola and Zika outbreaks. Its mission was and remains to strengthen global pandemic preparedness. I want to recognize the program's leaders, Mark Grodman, Wilma James, Lawrence Stanberry, and Philip LaRussa. They deserve our gratitude for making this symposium possible. We all recognize that central to the mission of a great university is the role of convening and hosting public discussions about issues of the day. It is a role that we particularly relish at Columbia. And it is a role that takes us, takes on greater significance when society is struggling with complex and urgent problems. Problems ultimately solvable only through the acquisition of new knowledge and broader public understanding of the needed remedies. And this is where universities have very special responsibilities. I can't think of any public forum hosted at Columbia of greater significance than the one we are embarking on this afternoon. The conversations will occur, that will occur here in the coming days on vaccines and global health, hold the potential to strengthen the response to the pandemic in the United States and other nations. Clearly a matter of the highest human importance. There will be a remarkable, remarkably impressive roster of ex experts from different fields, from different continents discussing the development and distribution of vaccines. There are representatives from governments, business, and the not-for-profit sectors. Over the course of the next five days, experts from diverse fields will discuss the work they are doing and the questions raised by the enormous challenges they face. Leaders in science and business will talk about vaccine development. Government officials and public health experts will share their experiences with distribution and ethicists and nonprofit managers will debate complicated and essential questions about equity and access. The pandemic has focused a harsh light on systemic inequities in this country and around the world. It has also deepened them. Underserved communities have suffered from much higher rates of infection and death. Many of these same groups have expressed hesitancy about getting vaccinated. These challenges are well known to all of us and surely we will all agree that they demand special consideration and commitment from individuals and institutions like those gathered here today. I'd like to extend my thanks again to all the, our guests and speakers for participating in this event. We are grateful for your time and insights. It is now my great pleasure to introduce you to today's moderator, Dr. Lawrence Stanberry. He is the Associate Dean for International Programs and co-director of the Program in Vaccine Education at Columbia University's Vagelos College of Physicians and Surgeons. He is a pediatrician, infectious disease specialist and authority on vaccine development. He is co-editor of several textbooks including Vaccines for Biodefense and Emerging and Neglected Diseases, Understanding Modern Vaccines and Viral Infections on Humans, Epidemiology and Control. Dr. Stanberry. Thank you, Dr. Bollinger. Um, I'd like to welcome our speakers and attendees to this uh, first session of our five-day symposium. Uh, the theme for today's session is national, regional, and global responses to an unprecedented challenge. It is a great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Jeremy Ferrara, a director of the Wellcome Trust, who's going to speak to us on the role of the Wellcome Trust uh, in COVID-19 vaccine preparedness. Uh, Dr. Ferrara. 
Lawrence, <coughs> Lawrence thank you very much indeed. I, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and it's a, it's a great um, pleasure to, to join you. I've had a day of Columbia University, actually, because I was uh, in reverse, invited the Earth Institute to join our board at Welcome earlier today. So it's been a, it's been a Columbia day from day, dawn till dusk tonight. Um, and, and always a, a, a pleasure. And, and actually, I, I think um, a, a lot can be learned in, in certainly my world of, uh, of public health from the way that Columbia has approached education and training and research and, and indeed the work through the Earth Institute. And it's a theme I'll, I'll actually uh, come back to if, if I may. But thank you very, very much for the um, for the invitation. It goes without saying, and, and it, it's a, it was a great introduction. We, we are living through history as being made. Uh, we will be, or not we, but some people will be pouring over the events of 2019, 2020, 21, and who knows how many years to come in the future, and pouring over the, the decisions that were made, the lessons to be learned, uh, and what happened and perhaps what didn't happen. And I, I think at this really um, awful moment, actually, when uh, all our heart goes out to, in the United States, I suspect today you may pass 500,000 deaths uh, from COVID-19. I, I, uh, it seems a remarkable thing to say. And uh, per capita, of course, where I am at the moment in the UK has suffered in actually a very similar way in similar numbers per capita. So this has had a dramatic impact on, on societies. And I, I think one of the roles that we can all play uh, now and in the future uh, is to learn what we did and what we didn't do um, and how we can deal with these issues in the future. Uh, whenever a, a society faces challenges like this, I think it's absolutely critical that it has time to then reflect and think through. And that moment may not be now because we still remain in the midst of this pandemic, but, but at some point in the future, we must. And uh, if you don't learn from those issues, then you have the danger of repeating them again. And I just echo the comments earlier about the role of universities in that. I think universities remain absolutely central to that thinking, their independence, their intellectual rigor, their willingness to ask questions that others may not be willing to is going to be really fundamental in thinking through the lessons from that and from COVID as we go uh, forward. But actually, although I'm, I will mention about my role, Welcome's role in, in vaccine development, I'd actually like to sort of paint a broader uh, uh, canvas, if you like, and, and actually take us back certainly to my own involvement in emerging infectious disease, which really, I actually started as a very junior doctor in London at the start of the HIV epidemic, but in the uh, latter part of my career started really 20 years ago with an outbreak that in many ways, I believe was the, um, the first, uh, if you like awareness uh, of the risks and the threats and the vulnerabilities of societies and indeed countries and potentially more broadly uh, to the issue of emerging infections. And that was, uh, I think, uh, the framing of, of where we are today. And, and uh, I think this is, has some very important uh, lessons for us as we think forward in the 21st uh, century. And it's framed around an, an article I was uh, fortunate enough to join others in writing from uh, the US, from Europe, from Asia, from Africa, uh, that was published, actually written in June, 20, published in Nature in, in November 2019, talking about uh, 21st century science for epidemic diseases. And, and the theme running through that is one of integration. Um, vaccines, which is the topic of this week's conversation, are absolutely fundamental to public health. They're absolutely fundamental, I believe, to changing the fundamentals around COVID-19. But they do remain, and this is from somebody steeped in vaccine uh, development and also implementation, they remain a part of a complex system. And we must, I think, appreciate the role they play both in the uh, initiation of the research and development, but also the implementation of them. So take us back to almost exactly 20 years ago, really, 20, uh, uh, 1999 in Malaysia, and an outbreak of something that came to be known as a Nipah infection. This was first noticed in a, in a province, Perak, uh, in Malaysia. Uh, and the first notice that something was going wrong was twofold. One was that pigs within the, that pig farming area were getting sick. 
And secondly, that pig handlers were getting sick as well. Uh, it was at a time of year when encephalitis, Japanese encephalitis in the main, was highly endemic in that part of Malaysia at that time. And the working assumption was that this was Japanese encephalitis. Uh, but two things were unusual. Uh, one is that pigs actually in the main don't get sick from Japanese encephalitis. They are, as so often, an, an end animal in a reservoir of uh, transmission. And secondly, that mostly uh, adults and particularly middle-aged uh, people don't usually suffer from Japanese encephalitis in regions of high endemicity. And yet here was uh, uh, animals getting sick and their adult uh, handlers, pig farmers getting sick. Um, it took a long time, uh, as I'm sure everybody involved in this would, would say, it took a long time for that to be appreciated. That circumstances and had to be explained if you were going to get to the bottom of it. Uh, indeed, there was a time when the animal sector and the human sector were not talking to each other. Uh, as you'll appreciate, in, uh, in Malaysia, pig farming is done by a certain sector of society and there were tensions within society of who was to blame for this. Uh, tensions that crossed ethnic boundaries, religious boundaries, language groups, uh, and indeed within the public uh, authorities. Uh, and there was also an element, uh, when you, particularly when you have silos of thinking, uh, whereby there was a degree of, of uh, confirmation bias, that once you'd set out on a route that this was Japanese encephalitis, that was the end of it, and there were no subsequent questions asked until perhaps it was too late, to the point that actually the, the interventions plan were actually to vaccinate pigs uh, in that community with Japanese encephalitis vaccines and doing so use the same syringes and actually unadvertedly uh, managed to spread the infection to a bigger uh, degree of pig farms in the area. To me, that was a, a really groundbreaking event because it brought together issues that uh, confirmation bias of siloed thinking, of the separation of human and animal health, of an appreciation that clinical medicine was somehow different. And when clinicians said, this is unusual to see encephalitis in an in a adult population, uh, the public health authorities across that spectrum remained in silos that their institutions put them in. And it was very difficult to bring people together to ask really what was really going on. It also raised the spectre, which we've seen in COVID as well, that these, these issues do not just have a, a health agenda. They have a much broader societal impact. And, uh, and, and these questions cannot really be just addressed by remaining in the health sector. They have to be looked at uh, more broadly. It included humans, animals, pol politics, uh, tensions uh, between and within societies, uh, across borders because of uh, pig farming exports from Malaysia. It involved agriculture as well as animal health. It involved, as I said, cultural and ethnic challenges and tensions, uh, and even had some degree of religious overtones. And also, and this comes onto the vaccines, at the time of the outbreak, we really didn't have diagnostics, treatment uh, to offer people who did get sick, and we certainly did not have vaccines. Uh, and we were therefore incredibly vulnerable uh, to require it to be only really able to implement, successful in the end, public health measures, which frankly, could have been present in the 19th century, but were being deployed in the start, the, almost the dawn of the 21st century. Um, we have to have not only the public health measures uh, that one needs, which can uh, buy you time, they can dampen down an epidemic, but ultimately you also need the tools of modern science to be able to bring to change the fundamentals of epidemics. And that's where vaccines and therapies and diagnostics uh, come in. Um, and if you think forward now over the last 20 years and you think through the more frequent and more complex epidemics that we've had, and I will forget some, but if you think of Nipah and then you think of H5N1, SARS-1, MERS in the Middle East, Ebola, of course, in West Africa, H1N1 pandemic of 2009, uh, Zika epidemic uh, of a few years ago, in, in, including, an, uh, in addition, dengue and chikungunya, what we're facing here is a changing ecosystem, a changing environment, a changing of human animal interfaces. Uh, we're seeing urbanization going on at a scale not witnessed before in human history, trade and travel, uh, and indeed societal tensions uh, and inequality, which uh, quite rightly uh, um, were referred to earlier as it's a, a exposed tensions within all of our 
societies. And I would also add to that geopolitics. Um, and so when I look at these epidemics and the experience of the last 20 years for me, it is about four overlapping circles. It is about the direct health consequence that comes from the infection itself and the tragedy in the United States this today or tomorrow very soon of 500,000 people dying, similar numbers in many other countries. Uh, but there's the second circle of the indirect consequences on all other aspects of healthcare, because when any country, even the richest country in the world, has that sort of uh, health uh, impact directly, it has consequences for everything else, including vaccination programs, maternal child health, cancer care, diabetic care, and every surgery and everything else. And so the second circle is of that indirect consequence. The third circle, and again, in COVID, we've seen this, and actually in a, a microcosm of it, we saw it in Nipah, it affects the economies, it affects trade, it affects trust between the governed and the governing, it affects education, it, it heightens inequality, and it raises tensions that would otherwise have been covered over in all of our societies. Uh, that happened in Nipah, and we have, of course, seen it enormously during COVID-19. And then finally, geopolitics. If geopolitics is not functional, as frankly it wasn't during periods of 2019 and 2020, east-west tensions, north-south tensions, then any uh, crisis like COVID-19 will be exaggerated because of that inability to be willing to work together. And we saw that in January 2020 with the blame between countries, unwillingness to work together uh, and the tensions that ensued from that. And I think we have to think of these epidemics in those broad, broad, uh, broad um, way of thinking. And the other thing I, I would say, and this brings me now onto vaccines, is that the uh, systems and structures and trust and frankly R&D and manufacturing and science that you have in place before you go into an epidemic critically defines how you will cope with it when you go in. And if I go back to that long list of uh, frequent and more complex epidemics that we've had in the last 20 years as the warning that something like COVID was going to happen, and we ask ourselves that each of those, did we really have 21st century interventions that could change the fundamentals of the infection as well as buying oneself time with critical public health measures? And the answer is no. In Nipah, we did not have diagnostics, we did not have treatment, and we did not have vaccines. And frankly, we still don't have treatments and vaccines for that infection, despite the fact that it is now endemic in Bangladesh and there was an outbreak that many will remember in Kerala in southern India. Uh, we took SARS forward and Thankfully, SARS stopped after about six or seven months, uh, with only at that time 800 people dying. But at, after SARS, uh, the world moved on within a few weeks or months. And the work that was done to create SARS diagnostics, uh, but particularly SARS treatment for SARS-like infections and vaccines for SARS, essentially dried up. Uh, because the world moves on very, very quickly. And as a result of that, and you could apply that as well to uh, Ebola until recently, you could apply it in many ways to influenza, where our treatments and vaccines remain suboptimal. You could certainly apply it as well to Zika and other infections. And that is that when faced with these epidemic diseases, there is a tendency, the optimism bias, as well as the confirmation bias of humanity, that we won't see those things again, and therefore we can move on to other issues. And as a result of that, uh, for each of those infections that I've mentioned over the last 20 years, we did not go on to develop and make sure that they were equitably accessible and manufactured in a distributed uh, way around the world. Uh, the critical uh, intervention tools that were so very important uh, and have been so very important in COVID-19. That is what led in, in 2015 uh, uh, for myself alongside Stanley Plotkin and uh, Adolf Mahmoud, who sadly uh, passed away a couple of years ago, to write an article on the need for a global uh, vaccine fund to create vaccines for these diseases for which there was essentially no commercial driver. They may or may not happen. Uh, we don't know if they'll be major national, regional or global uh, events when they happen. Uh, but there was no driver either from a funding agency national or philanthropic, or certainly a commercial enterprise to make sure that we had those vaccines, treatments and diagnostics for the diseases which were essentially epidemic in nature. That led in 2017 to the launch of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. And uh, although of course I'm very biased, 
I think in many ways that was absolutely an essential development. I just wish it had been there for five years instead of three at the time of COVID. But what it's essentially there to do is to ensure at the moment with a focus on vaccines that the world really does come together and say this is not the responsibility of any one country. Uh, this is the responsibility of the world to be able to make sure that we have these critical tools that can change the fundamentals of uh, an epidemic, can prevent them happening and can respond quicker to them, and that they will have those vaccines developed not only in the laboratory and on a shelf, but will be going through uh, clinical assessment in phase one trials, phase two trials if it's possible, and be available for phase three trials if and when that becomes necessary. That came to the fore actually during Ebola of 2014, where it was possible well, by working with many others around the world, including the National Institutes of Health, the European Commission and industry, to make sure that we pushed forward the Ebola vaccines during the horror of the Ebola outbreak in 2014 to 2016. And for one of the first occasions when during an epidemic, actually clinical and vaccine research not only was talked about, but actually it went ahead in the context of an ep ep epidemic. That is extremely difficult to do. Epidemics are frightening, they're chaotic, uh, and for the people involved, as I say, they're terrifying. But it is absolutely essential in these epidemic diseases that, that research goes ahead. But in order for that research to go ahead, you have to have done the basic science, the discovery angle, and you have to have those vaccines ready to go with a degree of safety data before you go into these epidemic situations with vaccines. You have to have built up the trust in the community prior to them being needed. And I think Ebola 2014-16 really changed the way we think about epidemics, the way we think about vaccine development, and the way we think about assessing vaccines in the context of an epidemic. I actually don't think it would have been possible to go in the period of about 10 months from the genome being released to actually using a vaccine as a public health measure in COVID without the lessons having been learned from that Ebola crisis of 2014 and the confidence, if you like, to go forward with vaccine development, but also go critically into ethically organized and well-conducted clinical research and vaccine research in the context of an epidemic. So I think that was groundbreaking. The other, during 2020, of course, the vaccine development has been nothing short of extraordinary. I know many people say that it's gone from being something taking 10 years to something that happened in 10 months. I actually think with the platform technologies that are now being developed and a much more aligned and integrated uh, approach to regulatory approvals and to clinical trials themselves, that actually we should be setting a new target for ourselves, that we go from genomic sequence uh, to a vaccine that can be deployed through a platform technology within 100 days, I think we could get there in the next three to five years. And I think the 10 year goal before the turn of this decade should be that we could go from a genome sequence using a platform technology, which we have a lot of data on immunogenicity and safety for. I think we should be plotting a course by the end of the decade of getting there to that point uh, within seven days. That's where I think we can get to. I think with platform technologies, whether RNA or Prime Boost or any future developments that may come from this, I think that sort of pathway is clear, but it will only be clear if we do this before an epidemic hits, we have the integration of not just vaccinologists, but people doing public health. We have engagement with the public to make sure that this is a trusted pathway. We have distributed manufacturing to make sure these can be produced where they need to be produced, not just in one or two countries around the world. And critically, we have a pathway to regulation that allows us to ensure that the public knows that these vaccines as they're developed will be safe and effective at turning the fundamentals around for a, a pan, an epidemic and a pandemic when it happens. I think that is a stretch goal, but I think the lessons of the last uh, Ebola crisis and the lessons of 2020 mean that that is now possible. Uh, and that should be our aim. If you think forward 100 days from January the 10th, 2020, then actually 100 days, in my view, for an even faster potentially moving epidemic would be too slow. And that's why I think we should go to 100 days. But in due course, I think we've got to be targeting a very much quicker. Uh, I think we need to bring the integration where we don't see people in, in uh, silos of animal health, human health, environment, uh, and public health and clinicians. Uh, and we need to make sure we, we integrate those with manufacturing and regulation. And finally, I'd say, if this isn't something that we as a, a fantastic university, 
uh, as vaccinologists or indeed as a funder from my perspective now, if we cannot make this happen, having learned the lessons of 2020, then who can? And I think we've got to go back to one of your previous great presidents and ask if not us, then who? Uh, and not what can we do, but what if we could? And that's got to be our target, I think. So Lawrence, I'll hand back to you if that's okay and happy to take any questions, but really uh, delight to join you today and a privilege to join this uh, uh, amazing series of, of talks and, and uh, discussion. No, thank you. That was, that was a, an absolutely remarkable presentation. Before we go on to the next speaker, I just there were questions that were popping up, and I just wanted to ask you a, about a couple of things. You know, your the paper that you wrote with Stanley uh, and Adele several, back in seventeen was fabulous, and obviously Seppi is, as you point out, you have so many reasons to be proud of that accomplishment. Gave us the platform to be able to so quickly move, and let's face it, all of us who've been involved in vaccine work, we've never seen anything that uh, that moved this quickly and equally shocking and surprising in a very happy way was the fact that the vaccines are showing up to be so unbelievably efficacious and apparently very, very safe as well. So you've got the platform, you've got the whole strategy around CEPI around the next one. And as you point out, they've just been such a series in the 21st century, um, most of which I think we could say we don't have vaccines for. Um, and uh, what's particularly curious about, I think, COVID-19 in this case, you think about what gave us control of HIV. It wasn't a vaccine. It was effective therapies. We have no effective therapies. So we're left with one arm missing in terms of what's needed. But coming back to the vaccine issue for a moment, I think when you're thinking down the road around future investments, the platforms are there. You can quickly develop the vaccines. Where does most of the money go? Financing acquisition and dealing with vaccine nationalism that we're seeing playing out. And while, while uh, COVAX is fabulous, it's only going to allow 20% of the vaccines needed in the country to be purchased. I was speaking with uh, Dr. Ruiz uh, uh, Matus earlier uh, about the fact that it may be 2025 before they've reached uh, the level of immunization that's gonna be achieved in highly developed uh, wealthy nations much sooner. So do you invest in the future around um, funding to purchase? Do you focus on vaccine safety efforts in order to assure the public that a vaccine developed in 100 days is not going to lead to infertility? Um, where, where do you see the next big roadblock um, that, uh, that's going to need to be prepared for? Yeah, I mean, there's a great, great question, uh, Lawrence. I, I, th I think a couple of things to pick up on there. Firstly, I think COVAX's ambition needs to change and, and certainly making this argument as, as one of the principles of the ACT Accelerator. 20% uh, was a figure that was plucked more or less from the sky at uh, some point last year when, when, it, when we could not be sure that all the vaccine candidates would make it through. As you absolutely rightly say, it's been astounding actually how successful essentially all of them, not all, but most of the platforms have been. Um, and I think the COVAX facility will be shifting that now to a much higher number and, and as vaccine uh, um, manufacturing now gets really ramped up, uh, I would hope that that would be shifting into the sort of 60% mark uh, in the very near future as manufacturing is, is ramped up. On the broader question of, of vaccines, I, I characterize this that in some ways, I think the vaccine world, um, and, and this I hope causes no offense to anybody, vaccine world ha has be became a little bit pessimistic uh, the vaccine uh, world was trying to make vaccines for diseases which were incredibly difficult. Uh, HIV, you mentioned, TB, uh, malaria. These are unbelievably difficult vaccines to make for, for reasons that I'm sure will be obvious to everybody. Um, I think there are a number of other infections out there where vaccines uh, can be developed but we just haven't paid them the attention we need to. And we could discuss what those are from chikungunya to Lhasa, uh, maybe even to dengue. And I, I appreciate how difficult that is. But I, I think my, one of my hopes is that this will, if you like, catalyze a, a more optimistic, but also a more realistic approach to vaccines. And we will actually see this tragically through 2020 and COVID as a sort of turning point where, if you like, vaccines, vaccine researchers, became, you know, the great people again, 
Um, and uh, because I think we may have become a little bit pessimistic because we've been trying to make incredibly difficult uh, uh, vaccines. I would argue that actually that list I gave you uh, from MERS to SARS-1 to uh, Lassa fever uh, to chikungunya uh, and many others are eminently um, able to be have developed safe and effective vaccines. And uh, I think we can instill a bit maybe of optimism in this in this field. I just have a note of caution on that. Uh, I think we have got a little bit lucky, if you like, with COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, in that I think the uh, immunity after natural infection is more than we perhaps thought a year ago that it would be. Um, after a natural infection, I think you do have a pretty good period of, uh, we don't know how long, but pretty good protection uh, data from the US and from the UK now. Uh, and therefore mimicking that with a vaccine, I think was perhaps easier than we thought it was going to be maybe in Fe February and March of, of last year. And the last comment I'd make is I think trust in vaccines is absolutely critical. I think that can be best achieved by using platform technologies wherever possible and a respected and never undermined regulatory pathway for them to be true, uh, where we can have a platform, we know the safety profile of the platform, and we can um, then uh, not be agnostic to the pathology and the virus or the or the pathogen, but we can at least use a platform that allows us to address different uh, different uh, infections in the future. And then finally on manufacturing, I think one of the lessons from COVID is we've got to have greater distributed ma manufacturing capacity. And I would predict there'll be advances in engineering and manufacturing technology that would allow a better distributed model. I think you're on mute or I'm on mute, Lawrence. I hope it's not me. Thank you. No, it was me. <laughs> the um, That's a, such a wonderfully optimistic picture. It does strike me that if, as you suggest, we can start uh, attacking some of those diseases that have been endemic for a very long time, so that you're needing a much larger number of vaccines and uh, and doses that one can well imagine the kinds of manufacturing capability being dispersed globally in ways that I think we've all felt were needed for quite some time. So very, very encouraged by your your uh, your picture of the future. So uh, thank you. Thank you. So we will uh, move to our next speaker. Um, and I'm really very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Shabir Mahdi. Uh, Dr. Mahdi is a, a very accomplished vaccinologist and recently took on responsibilities as the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Visvadastan. Um, and uh, Dr. Mahdi is going to speak on the topic of uh, South African perspective on vaccine preparedness and availability. Shabir? Oh, sorry. Uh, so good evening, everyone. So what I'm going to speak on is uh, the occurrence in South Africa when it came to the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, but I, what I thought would be important is just to put this into perspective in terms of our understanding of COVID-19 on the African continent, uh, and particularly the experience in South Africa in contrast to what is being experienced um, uh, elsewhere on the African continent. So as has been pointed out, we're reaching the 100, we just passed the past 110 million mark in terms of number of documented COVID-19 cases. And Africa, which constitutes about 18% of the global population has only accounted for just under over 3% of those 100 million, 110 million cases. Uh, of the 3.8 million cases uh, that have been documented in South Africa, uh, close onto about 45% of those cases have been documented in a single country and that is South Africa. And what you see on the right-hand side is really the sort of variability that exists between the experience in South Africa in terms of documented COVID-19 cases uh, compared to the rest of the continent uh, put together. Now, the reason for this is largely a consequence. The reason for this is largely a consequence of the ability of countries to scale up in terms of testing. So although there's roughly about 43 African countries that have got some capacity to undertake testing, as is obvious from the left-hand side, the rate of testing being done on the continent 
is fairly nominal, uh, including in a country such as South Africa, which has got the highest testing rate coming in at about 200 per thousand of the population. Uh, that is far less than what exists in many other high income countries, where many countries are now uh, in the region of having conducted between 1,000 and 2,000 uh, tests uh, per capita, per 1,000 of the population. And there's obviously a direct association in terms of the income of the country, the GDP, and the rate of testing that's being done. So to a large extent, the experience in South Africa is one uh, which basically reflects uh, the heightened ability to detect, detect COVID-19 cases in a context of being able to actually do the testing, which is lacking in the most of the rest of Africa. Now, Jeremy pointed out that we need to learn from history. And unfortunately, it would appear that we actually haven't learned from history when it comes to understanding the impact testing might have in terms of underestimation of COVID-19 cases. So rather than Africa being spared uh, from the burden of COVID-19, I think reflecting on what happened in 2009 with the H1N1 pandemic, where there were just under 500 laboratory confirmed cases during the course of the pandemic, uh, less than 5% of those cases uh, during the course of the pandemic were recorded in Africa and Southeast Asia, which constituted about 38% of the world's population. Yet when a pandemic had passed, based on CDC estimates, uh, all, almost 51% of all of the deaths that occurred due to the H1N1 uh, pandemic had actually occurred in Africa and Southeast Asia. So there clearly is a disconnect in terms of the number of documented cases at a point in time when the pandemic is ongoing, which is largely influenced uh, by the, the availability of testing and the net uh, results of such a uh, pandemic in terms of mortality. And this is more of a cautionary in that although there is a sense that inf the infection mortality rate might well be lower in the, on the African continent for a number of reasons, uh, in terms of actually quantifying the impact that is had in terms of deaths, I think that is something that's completely underappreciated at this point in time. So I'm going on to South Africa and its plans in terms of the rollout of the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. So South Africa has been fortunate in that uh, it's the only African continent, a country, uh, which has been host to four different vaccine trials, including two, three vaccine trials for which we were able to get uh, South African specific vaccine efficacy estimates. Now, government had uh, decided on a phase approach, which was somewhat consistent with what WHO was recommending, in that uh, to start off with healthcare workers, uh, South Africa's population is roughly about 60 million individuals, uh, 1.2 million being healthcare workers. And then they were planning on moving on to essential healthcare, essential workers, as well as other individuals at high risk of severe disease. And those numbers came in at, in a region of about a further 14 million. And then they planned on moving on to phase three, where they were targeting the rest of the population. However, some of the challenges that were experienced uh, started off in terms of government's initial approach to primarily focusing on the COVAX facility to source its vaccine supply. And uh, paradoxically, South Africa being an upper middle income country uh, ended up needing to contribute per unit cost of vaccine that would be procured uh, from the COVAX facility that was much higher than what it would have been able to actually procure directly through bilaterals, including as an example with the AstraZeneca vaccine which in the Euro region has been, uh, it's come out in the region of about two and a half dollars. And in fact, Pfizer as an example, were offering South Africa the Pfizer vaccine at about $10 per dose based on, it, on the price tiering system. In contrast, the ask of the COVAX facility for South Africa to participate was roughly at about $13 per dose. Now, uh, because of that, uh, because of the situation in South Africa in terms of the dire state of the economy, our government then decided that they were only able to commit to procuring about a uh, vaccine is sufficient for about 10% of the population. So with this over dependency in a sense on a COVID facility initially, unfortunately the country did delay in terms of finali finalizing bilateral agreements uh, with other manufacturers. And eventually, more largely driven by public pressure, they entered into a bilateral with Serum Institute of India and ended up paying per unit cost of the AstraZeneca vaccine that was double the cost uh, that the EU were actually being able to procure the vaccine. In addition to which they were fairly limited, limited in terms of the quantity of vaccine that was available, as well as the shelf life of the vaccine that was being made available. Now, since then government has uh, continued engaging in bilaterals and to date, to date it estimates it's been able to procure uh, about 20 million doses of vaccine. However, the big unknown related to those 20 million doses is exactly what quantity of vaccine would become available. Uh, before the expected next resurgence, which we estimate would occur in the period of the next three to four months. 
But the major curveball that was thrown in terms of these plans uh, was the evolution of the B1351 variant, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. And despite the WHO making a recommendation for ongoing use of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which government was able to procure from Serum Institute of India, at least for healthcare workers, uh, South Africa then decided uh, to not to roll out the AstraZeneca vaccine, despite the, the WHO recommendation on the contrary. Now, this particular variant uh, first evolved in a country around about October, and the reason for being able to identify this particular variant was because South Africa had then embarked on a systematic approach in terms of sequencing of the virus since the onset of the, of the pandemic. And after observing an uh, increase in terms of number of cases towards the end of October in one of the more coastal areas known as the Eastern Cape, uh, they went about investigating the possible reasons for that, including uh, undertaking sequencing, and they were able to identify this B1351 variant, uh, which subsequently spreads throughout the rest of the country and is currently responsible for close to 95% of all of the COVID-19 cases that are occurring in the country. And one of the consequences uh, with this B1351 variant is similar to the variant uh, that was first identified in the UK, the N501 V1 uh, variant. Uh, this variant is much more transmissible. And for all intents and purposes, what occurred in South Africa is that despite serious surveys indicating that as many as 25 to 30 percent of adults had actually been infected during the course of the first wave, we experienced a resurgence which far exceeded the first wave in terms of the number of COVID-19 cases, as well as the number of people that died. So during the course of the first wave, using the excess mortality data, we estimated about 48,000 people had died of COVID-19. And during the course of the second wave, that figure is coming on close to 100,000 uh, COVID-19 deaths having occurred during the course of the second wave. So the resurgence in South Africa, despite the high force of earlier infection, was one where the total number of COVID-19 cases had occurred, as well as the number of deaths that occurred far exceeded what actually occurred during the course of the first wave. Now, like I mentioned, we were fortunate in that we had embarked on different uh, COVID-19 vaccine trials uh, very much at a time when the first wave was subsiding. And one of the studies was the AstraZeneca vaccine. And when analyzed in terms of the efficacy of the vaccine against the ancestral virus, what we observed is that 14 days after the first dose, there was a 75% reduced risk of developing COVID-19 amongst the vaccinees compared to the placebo recipients. So clearly the AstraZeneca vaccine was performing uh, against the ancestral virus that had been circulating. However, unfortunately, subsequently in the primary objective analysis where we evaluated efficacy again for two weeks after the second dose of vaccine and the timing of accrual of these cases coincided essentially with the evolution of the B1351 variant. What we essentially observed against the B1351 variant was lack of efficacy against mild to moderate infection due to the B1351 variant. And that was obviously disappointing. And this was one of the reasons why government uh, decided not to continue its planned rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccine. But I need to emphasize that these were data specifically in a young age group demographic, and none of these cases were severe disease. Now, uh, Jeremy pointed out that uh, we do uh, have an impression that uh, immunity against uh, that is uh, induced by natural infection is longer lasting. Unfortunately, the experience in South Africa with the B1351 variant, and this is data from the Novavax study, which looked at the placebo group, and 30% of enrollees into the study were actually seropositive at a time of enrollment. Uh, analyzing the seropositive and seronegative group in terms of rate of mild to moderate COVID-19, we find that uh, earlier infection with a, with a prototype virus did not actually protect against mild to moderate infection due to the B1351 variant, where the rate of infection in these groups was almost identical. Uh, but again, to emphasize that this, this was mainly focused on mild to moderate infection and uh, whether past infection with a prototype virus actually does confer protection against severe disease, uh, it's probably an unknown. Uh, there is some empiric data from South Africa which would suggest that it might at least confer protection against severe disease due to the B1351 variant. Now, all is not bleak. Uh, fortunately, another study that was underway in South Africa as well, uh, which was also perfectly timed in terms of being able to get an efficacy readout against the B1351 variant, was the Novavax vaccine, which we know to be much more immunogenic than AstraZeneca or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And in South Africa, looking at the HIV negative group, the efficacy of this vaccine against mild to moderate COVID-19 due to the B1351 
351 variant was 60%, which was lower than what was observed in the UK, where it came out at about 89%. And much of the difference between these two vaccine efficacy estimates is probably uh, because of uh, some knockout in terms of neutralizing antibody activity induced by the vaccine uh, related to the B1351 variant. And then finally, the last efficacy trial, which was an efficacy trial that was done in a somewhat different uh, population demographic in that it was enriched for individuals at risk of developing uh, severe disease, was a single dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, and in South Africa, the efficacy readout for this particular vaccine was 57% against moderate to severe disease and 89% against severe disease and death. There are differences in terms of the criteria that we use to analyze for endpoint cases between the studies. So I would avoid making any head-to-head -head comparisons. But what these data do show us is that the first generation of vaccine does probably confer protection, at least against severe disease. Now, the B1351 variant has uh, currently been identified in close on to 35 countries. And in many of these countries, it's associated with community transmission rather than just imported cases. But what remains a large unknown is the extent to which this variant is actually disseminated into other parts of Southern Africa. And again, the reason for that is the fairly limited and almost non-existent uh, capacity to undertake testing, let alone sequencing, sequencing of COVID-19 cases. But considering the huge amount of traffic that takes place between South Africa and its neighboring countries and their neighboring countries, it's very likely that the B1351 variant has now disseminated to much of uh, Southern Africa, at least. So where are we with the rollout? Uh, and yeah, I've just been able to put Africa to try to feature on the ro rollout per 100 uh, of the population. And I think these are data which don't come as much of a surprise and that pretty much except for South Africa, which has started to implement the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as an implementation trial for healthcare workers, uh, there simply is absolutely close to zero rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, whereas countries such as Israel are coming in close to vac having vaccinated almost 80% of the adult population. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us, again, we haven't really learned from history. And when we go back to H1N1 pandemic of 2009, uh, vaccines, the H1N1 pandemic uh, vaccine that was developed uh, around about September 2009, the WHO eventually were able to procure roughly about 32 million doses of vaccine to, to African countries, to 34 African countries. But the reality is that the timing of the rollout of those vaccines in African countries only occurred at a time when the pandemic had actually passed. In addition to which only two thirds of the vaccine were actually introduced, which speaks to the huge challenges that are going to prevail on the continent in terms of actually implementation of COVID-19 immunization, uh, once the big challenge of actually procuring doses has been dealt with, dealt with. And I think this is something which the, the continent certainly, including South Africa, is very much lagging, uh, just based on the experience over the past uh, week, which is still at this infant stage, granted, but in terms of the challenges of just being able to vaccinate healthcare workers itself has been a challenge. So why are we where we are? Well, unfortunately, the reality is that there's almost zero capacity in terms of manufacturing uh, ability of, of vaccines on the continent. There's some limited capacity to, that takes place in Senegal, Tunisia, Egypt, and South Africa itself. Uh, despite the attempts of setting up a manufacturing facility for the past 20 years, there simply hasn't been uh, that ability to actually take, uh, take it on from scratch right through to uh, commercialization. So where we, where we are right now is that firstly, in terms of the South African context, and this might well be an experience from many other upper middle income countries with similar sort of economic challenges here in South Africa, is paradoxically the COVAX facility doesn't necessarily lend itself to early and timely access of affordable vaccines for, low, for middle income countries. It might work certainly in favor of low income countries, but for upper middle income countries such as South Africa, it certainly does uh, pose challenges. Uh, the evolution of the B1351 variant in South Africa, unfortunately, probably resulted because of immune, immune evasion, uh, resulting because of the high force of exposure that occurred in the country during the course of the first wave. But that has really disrupted the planning in terms of the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines. And I think where we are in terms of the first generation of COVID-19 vaccines is really to recalibrate our thinking in terms of what these vaccines are going to be able to achieve. So whilst in a country such as Israel, it might well have been able to bring about an interruption in terms of the chain of transmission of the virus. Uh, I think on, in a country such as South Africa, where the B1351 variant seems to be 
resistant, at least to the neutralizing antibody that's induced by this vaccine and doesn't protect against mild infection, uh, the focus really needs to be one of trying to prevent death and to relieve our healthcare systems in terms of minimizing the number of severe COVID-19 cases that do occur. So with those few words, I thank you for your attention. Dr. Mahdi, thank you for that, that remarkable talk. Um, I think we're going to save questions for a moment and, and hear our other uh, speakers and then have a, a group discussion around some of the issues you raised, particularly the issue of, uh, of the variants and, and what's that going to do in terms of the projection of when we might reach some sort of meaningful herd immunity. Um, so our, our next speaker um, is uh, Dr. Nancy, Nancy Messonnier. She's the director of the National Center for Immunization and um, um, Respiratory Diseases at the US CDC. Uh, and due to pressing demand, she wasn't able to attend uh, today, but she has provided us with a video of her talk. And the title of her talk is the US CDC Perspective on Vaccine Preparedness and Availability. So if we could uh, go ahead and uh, show Dr. Messonnier's uh, video. Hello, my name is Dr. Nancy Messonnier. I'm the director of CDC's National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. I lead CDC's COVID-19 vaccine efforts. Although remarkable advances have been made in science and medicine during the past century, we are constantly reminded that we live in a universe of microbes, viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and fungi that are forever changing and adapting themselves to the human host and the defenses that we humans create. Pandemics have occurred sporadically over the last 100 years. The last three pandemics in 1918, 1957, and 1968 killed approximately 40 million, 2 million, and 1 million people worldwide, respectively. Unfortunately, more than 2 million people worldwide have already died from COVID-19. Until now, most scientists believed the next pandemic threat would likely come in the form of a novel influenza virus in Asia and Europe. When CDC worked with our partners in the federal government to produce a national strategy to combat pandemic influenza, we predicted that based on history and science, we would face at least one pandemic during this century. This proved to be true in late December, 2019, when what we now know as COVID-19 emerged in China. Preparing for a pandemic requires leveraging all instruments of national power and coordinated action by all segments of government and society. Viruses do not respect the distinctions of race, sex, age, profession, or nationality, and are not constrained by geographic boundaries. As we've seen with previous pandemics, COVID-19 has come in waves, each lasting months and passing through communities of all sizes across the nation and world. And as predicted, while the COVID-19 pandemic has not damaged power lines, banks, or computer networks, it has threatened critical infrastructure and upended most of our daily activities. Thankfully, in less than a year, multiple COVID-19 vaccines have been developed, put through clinical trials, manufactured, authorized, distributed, and administered. The federal government invested in multiple vaccines, allowing manufacturers to develop and test vaccines at the same time as they were being produced. This was all with the goal that one or more vaccines would prove to be safe and effective. We now have two vaccines that have been authorized by FDA and a third one under review. The initial two vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna use a vaccine platform, messenger RNA, that has been under development for years. So while these are new vaccines, the technology is not. 
And perhaps even more importantly, the federal government has been able to tap into our underlying immunization infrastructure to help get vaccines where they need to be and administered to those who need it. The U.S. has a comprehensive immunization program with a robust infrastructure at the federal, state, and local level that ensures Americans of all ages are protected from multiple diseases. The nation's immunization infrastructure strengthens vaccination practices in both the public and private sectors, assesses how vaccines are impacting disease trends and outbreaks, and is constantly monitoring vaccine safety and effectiveness. And scientifically based vaccine policies are a foundation of the U.S. immunization system. CDC relies on its independent advisory committee, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, to help make national recommendations for vaccine use. Throughout the pandemic, the committee has met regularly to hear the latest on vaccine development and disease epidemiology, both factors that play important roles in making decisions on who should get vaccine initially when supply is limited. The committee considered four ethical principles in addition to scientific data and implementation feasibility when making decisions. Those principles include maximizing benefit and minimizing harms, promoting justice, mitigating health inequities, and promoting transparency. After looking at the epidemiology of COVID-19, the committee decided that when supplies are limited, vaccines should be given to healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents, as well as essential workers, people 65 and older, and people aged 16 to 64 with underlying medical conditions. While CDC makes national recommendations for who should be offered COVID-19 vaccine first, each state has its own plan for deciding who will be vaccinated and how they can receive vaccines. CDC is using integrated IT systems, both public and private, as well as new and existing, to ensure successful vaccine allocation, distribution, administration, monitoring, and reporting. Each year, CDC safely distributes vaccine for manufacturers to nearly 40,000 public and private healthcare providers across the nation. In a typical year, CDC delivers more than 80 million vaccine doses to providers. We've now delivered that many COVID-19 vaccines in just 11 weeks. Daily doses administered continues to rise with more than 1.6 million doses administered per day. The goal is to ensure every community everywhere has access to COVID-19 vaccines. To do that, and to have a successful COVID-19 vaccine program, we understand that it will require a combination of traditional and innovative approaches to where vaccines are administered. So far, CDC has two public-private partnerships to bring vaccines to Americans, including the most vulnerable. CDC partnered with CVS, Walgreens, and Managed Healthcare Associates to offer on-site COVID-19 vaccination services for long-term care facilities, including skilled nursing facilities, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, residential care homes, and adult family homes. Long-term care settings in particular have proven to be high-risk locations for COVID-19 exposure and spread of the virus. This program provides end-to-end -end management to facilitate safe vaccination while reducing the burden on facilities and health departments. Over 6 million doses have already been administered through this program. Additionally, CDC partnered with 21 national pharmacy partners and networks of independent pharmacies representing over 40,000 retail and long-term care pharmacy locations nationwide 
to ensure that the public had access to COVID-19 vaccines in a setting they are familiar with. Almost 90% of people live within five miles of a community pharmacy, and nearly one million doses have already been administered in the first week of this program. Both of these programs capitalize on bringing vaccine to locations people trust, and as we work to ensure every American has access to COVID-19 vaccines, we anticipate seeing vaccine being administered in schools, churches, and community centers. It's essential that as we roll out this vaccine program, we ensure that the people who need it most can have access to it and that they trust it's safe and effective. While the current vaccines and the ones we hope to have soon are rigorously studied during clinical trials, there is a vast network of safety systems that keep monitoring vaccines once they are being used. For COVID-19 vaccines, CDC and federal partners are using a toolbox of existing and new systems to ensure the safety of COVID-19 vaccines. This includes relying on existing systems that monitor the safety of vaccines every day. These systems work together to identify signals and evaluate in depth whether the signal is related to vaccination or just coincidence. Additionally, CDC has also developed a new voluntary smartphone-based tool, vSafe, that uses text messaging and web surveys to provide personalized health check-ins after patients receive a COVID-19 vaccination. To date, our data suggests these vaccines are safe and effective. But we know that doesn't matter if people are unwilling to take them. It's essential that everyone have confidence in the vaccination program. That includes having trust in the vaccine, the vaccinator, and the system that produced it. CDC is working with communities nationwide to build trust in the midst of a pandemic, especially in communities of color that have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 and have experienced systemic racism and inequity in access to healthcare. Recently, additional vaccine has been given to HRSA-funded health centers in multiple states to ensure that certain disproportionately affected populations, like public housing residents, migrant or seasonal agricultural workers, patients with limited English proficiency, and individuals experiencing homelessness have access to vaccine. This program is expected to expand to all states. We still have a long way to go. Our state, local, tribal, and territorial public health departments have been and will continue to be key in ending this pandemic. Their diligent hard work under immense pressure has been consistent and measured. And we would not be where we are today without the incredible work of healthcare providers at all levels. Many of them have already been vaccinated and are back to protecting us. COVID-19 is the most significant public health challenge to face our nation in more than a century. This pandemic is unprecedented and unimaginable. For most people, the pandemic has upended their daily lives. We've learned how to properly wear masks and stand six feet apart. Now we have vaccines to help us defeat the virus. And experience has shown us that vaccines are powerful tools. Reaching every individual who would benefit from vaccination is an important and ambitious goal, but one that can help us end this pandemic and allow us to see our friends and families once again. Thank you. We very much appreciate um, Dr. Messonnier taking the time to make the recording for us to give us a perspective uh, from the US CDC's vantage point. Um, 
we're going to, we started off in Africa with Dr. Mahdi and then Dr. Messonnier. Now we're moving to, uh, to Asia. And we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Young Mi Ji, who's the chief executive officer of the Institute Pasteur Korea uh, as our next speaker. Uh, and she's going to talk to us on the topic of uh, South Korean perspective on vaccine preparedness and availability. Uh, Dr. G. So thank you very much for inviting me to the uh, symposium today. It's, um, I'm just going to share my slide with you. So in uh, my presentation, I'm going to share the, the South Korean perspective on vaccine preparedness and availability with you. Um, so first slide shows the COVID-19 situation in Korea. So we have confirmed more than 86,000 uh, cases with 1.8% um, mortality. And uh, uh, the positivity rate among tested is about 1.4%. And currently, in, we are in the middle of a third, uh, uh, extended third wave. So with the voluntary uh, free testing of asymptomatic people in the capital region, around 2 million people were tested in uh, 104 testing centers. And among those uh, 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 tested, 0.28% were uh, positive. And uh, also recent uh, antibody testing um, with the military, military tenants uh, showed about 0.3% uh, antibody positive rate. And also in terms of variant, uh, we have identified the uh, UK and uh, South Africa and uh, Brazil variant uh, from international uh, incoming travelers uh, since December last year, a total of 119 were confirmed, uh, 100 UK, and uh, 13 uh, South African and one uh, and six Brazil. And we also detected uh, 29 variant strains uh, from local uh, outbreaks starting from February uh, this year. Uh, among them, 28 were UK and one uh, South African. And sequencing was performed for all uh, uh, positive cases from arriving travelers and also uh, representative samples of outbreak cases. So we have sequenced around uh, 10 uh, positive cases per each outbreak. So, um, uh, so among those uh, uh, positive cases, around 3.6% were sequenced, but the government is uh, trying to increase the proportion of sequencing to uh, 10%. So government announced the vaccination plan on 28th of uh, January. So vaccination will, be, will begin actually just a few days later, uh, February 26th with, uh, with AstraZeneca and also next day uh, with the Pfizer, um, which we received from COVAX. And the list of priority groups were announced and there will be huge interministerial efforts is, uh, for example, the vaccine transportation will be supported by the uh, Ministry of Defense, by military and also police. And there will be uh, mobile vaccination teams uh, operate by public health centers. And we will uh, have uh, around 250 vaccination centers, especially set up for Mo Moderna and Pfizer vaccines and over uh, 10,000 vaccination facilities for AstraZeneca, uh, Janssen, and also Novavax. And government have also um, a comprehensive AEFI monitoring and compensation system. And we have done some simulation exercise uh, on the Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines. But in fact, the first vaccination uh, was performed for 1,900 Korean soldiers in US Army base in Korea with Moderna vaccine. So our government uh, secured the, the vaccines for uh, 79 million population. Our population is around uh, 51 million. Uh, so if you see the portfolio of vaccines, uh, we have AstraZeneca vaccine for um, uh, 10 million people. 
So this is number of people, not doses. Uh, the doses will be double. Uh, with the COVAX, uh, 10 million population, and Janssen, 6 million, Pfizer, 13 million, and uh, 20 million each for Moderna and Novavax. So as I mentioned, first vaccination will start with the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine uh, from 26th of February. Uh, and this is SK Bioscience, a Korean company produced vaccine, SCMO. And this was licensed uh, by Korea FDA on uh, February 10. This was also uh, emergency use listed by WHO on February uh, 15. And the next one, uh, the uh, Pfizer vaccine will be used for the uh, uh, 60,000 people from 27th of February. And if you see the last Novavax vaccine, uh, this is also SK Bioscience uh, uh, produced vaccine. And also uh, they have received technology transfer from uh, Novavax. And this is the information uh, available for the uh, public to explain the procedure of authorization of vaccines by the ministry and the storage and distribution and vaccination and also uh, AFA monitoring of, of COVID-19 vaccines. So I'm sorry that I was not re really able to uh, translate everything into English to just try, just uh, had some, some uh, explanation uh, in the, in the figure. Uh, and then that for the logistics, uh, uh, this shows the supply and this distribution of five COVID-19 vaccines, which we will use in, in my country. So for the AstraZeneca and Janssen and Novavax, we will just use uh, ordinary um, medical uh, facility for two mRNA vaccines, uh, which we will receive from abroad we will uh, use specialist uh, established, established vaccination centers, as I mentioned. And um, the government is actually targeting vaccination of whole population, excluding a pregnant woman and the population under 18 years old. And obviously uh, when, uh, for, the, for those uh, groups, when we have uh, the data available, we will um, of course uh, consider vaccination. And considering time of vaccine supply and available doses and effectiveness and uh, goals of vaccination, uh, we are vaccinating about uh, 1.3 million during the first quarter. So the frontline has care workers at COVID-19 treatment hospitals and people staying in nursing uh, long-term care hospitals or facilities and healthcare workers at high-risk medical facilities and uh, frontline uh, responders will be vaccinated and and 9 million uh, people will be vaccinated during uh, second quarter and those include older adults and workers at uh, welfare facilities and disabled and homeless population and over 65 years old healthcare workers and pharmacists. And during the third and fourth quarter, we are targeting the vaccination of 33 million people. So as I mentioned, that the, uh, we will operate the vaccination centers for uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, uh, 20, uh, two, two, 250 vaccination centers with special setting. And uh, with the AstraZeneca and Janssen vaccine, we will use the designated medical facilities. And the government also uh, reinforced the uh, comprehensive AFA monitoring system of uh, COVID-19 vaccines. We also had a simulation exercise on the vaccination uh, with Pfizer vaccine. Uh, there was a simulation exercise at four vaccination centers from uh, 9th of February, and this will be expanded. And also recently uh, we had uh, exercise with the uh, AstraZeneca vaccines. We also have uh, um, ongoing COVID-19 vaccine uh, clinical trials in Korea. So those ones in, uh, in bold shows that uh, the, the ones we, uh, the Korean companies are developing. Uh, so the, the most of those vaccine candidates are uh, phase one or, and two clinical trials. 
uh, there are also um, vaccine candidates in a preclinical stage, and we hope that at least some of them will uh, succeed. And um, government also had a huge efforts in, in communicating with the public on the vaccination plan. So recent survey for the first vaccination group shows the consent rate uh, for the vaccination was 93.8%. Uh, so uh, with AstraZeneca, 93.6%, uh, with Pfizer, 94.6%. So um, the, uh, the consent rate was quite high. So uh, the, uh, our target is uh, vaccinating um, uh, everyone, uh, ex except those uh, uh, the, the um, pregnant women and under age, uh, under 18 years old by, um, uh, the, uh, at, at least herd immunity, achieving herd immunity by, by November this year. And uh, with continued efforts to communicate with public and extensive preparation uh, for the vaccination at, uh, for last uh, few months, uh, we hope that we can achieve this um, target. Um, and once again, I want to thank you for the uh, inviting me to the symposium and I would be ha happy to answer any questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. G. That was a very, very interesting talk and um, so very grateful that you could join us today. I think the audience should be aware of the fact that uh, Dr. G uh, is 14 hours time difference from New York and so um, this is um, very, very early in the morning for her. We so are most grateful for your willingness to be up this late. Um, so we have a, a final speaker who's going to give us a perspective on a different part of the world, uh, South America and, uh, and the Caribbean islands. Um, and the speaker is Dr. Ruiz uh, uh, Matus, who is the chief of the Comprehensive Family Immunization Unit of the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO. And his presentation is entitled uh, The Pan-American Health Organization Perspective on Vaccine Preparedness and Delivery. Uh, Dr. Ruiz, please. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> and, and thank you to, to invite us to present here. And uh, I hope that you can look in my screen. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, the, the idea in this time is to present what is the experience that we have in the perspective and vaccine preparation that we have in the countries in the America. And, and the first, uh, please give me a chance to put in context because we had a similar situation that the college in South Africa. This is what happened about the access at the vaccine and the pandemic influenza is one in one that we have uh, some years ago. The first countries to receive the vaccine is the countries that have the production and to have this uh, <clears throat> position to, to take a, 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 a lot of uh, uh, number of doses to cover uh, their population and uh, US and Canada received the vaccine in the short time. But uh, after all this, uh, <clears throat> the countries to receive the vaccine in the America is the countries to have a bilateral agreement like Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico and the, all, the third part of the countries to receive the vaccine is uh, all the countries to have agreement through the revolving fund that, to cover the majority of the countries in the America. 31 countries in the America uh, were covered for, through the revolving fund in, in that uh, moment. And the, the end of this is the number of countries to receive a WHO donation. In the majority of these countries receive the number of vaccines or the doses of vaccine what the, uh, at the moment that the pandemic wa was ending. You know? and, and, uh, and with this, it's very important to take in consideration in the pandemic that we had now <clears throat> to look for the equity in the access of the vaccine. But the other point is that it is necessary to take this uh, opportunity for the introduction of COVID-19 vaccine, take in consideration what is happening with the national and the regular program. Uh, this is the, the, the report that we have from some countries in Latin America and the Caribbean about the uh, impact 
of the in the immunization program into the pandemic context. No, the, you can to see here the decreasing number of the doses of DPT3. It's around the 32 percent in June, and the re decrease of the number of doses of measles and rubella vaccine. It's uh, around the 21 in June, month by by month in this. But uh, obviously, it, the impact of the pandemic, we in America had to move six uh, campaigns against uh, missiles in that moment. And in that moment, we had a very important outbreak of missiles in Brazil and transmission of some cases in Mexico. And it was very important to maintain the, the, the campaigns about uh, the missiles. But the other point is the impact that we had in the uh, what we have now yet in the in the uh, epidemiological surveillance about the vaccine preventable disease the impact that we have in the surveillance of missiles and the surveillance of polio it's really important for all the countries in america and is necessary to take in consideration in this context of the pandemic with this in Pajo, we work with all the countries in the america and to create this the immunization program in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic that uh, to, to give the message of the country how to maintain the program, that it was very important for this. But uh, the countries who tell us there are different strategies to try to maintain the coverage that we have or have to maintain to stop the fall down of the number of doses that we are applying. This is different strategy that the countries put in place, but it was really, really important in the period between March and September of the last year, more than 100 million of doses of flu vaccine uh, were applied in South America countries. Now it's really interesting to look how the vaccination in car, how the vaccination in communities, how the vaccination in other, when we change the open hours for the immunization program was really important and to cover more than 100 million of uh, people with the flu vaccine. But in that context, all the countries in the America began the preparation for the introduction of COVID-19 vaccine, but began with all these questions that, uh, that we discussed uh, in, in the previous speaker, no? which is the vaccine that will be successful what is the duration of the protection? What is the, the supplies that we have now? The number of doses, the, uh, the, the schedule, what is the prioritary groups? What is the cold chain requirement, et cetera, et cetera. No? All the countries in America began with this, with, with this question. And some of these questions are present yet, no? and, and we continue taking this. But in the preparation in the countries in the America, the first point is that we took the values framework core principles that was uh, <coughs> created by the SAGE, the, the strategic group of experts from WHO. And, and with this values framework was important that all the countries began to work in the, in the creation of the, of the program. But the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean has only uh, these ways to have access at the vaccines. One and the most important for us is the COVAX through the COVAX facility, no, that it's important for all the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. The second is when uh, the countries had a bilateral agreements that an important number of countries in America uh, are in this uh, position. And the third is that the countries are receiving uh, important donation from other countries uh, into the region or out of the region. It's uh, for us, the mechanism of COVAX, the COVAX facility, is one of the most important uh, uh, point to have access to the vaccine in the, in the America countries. Why? 39, 37 countries in the America are participating in the COVAX facility. All the countries of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean are into the COVAX facility in this moment. Of this, 10 of these countries are for AM, under the umbrella or AMC eligible countries and 27 uh, countries are self-financing countries. But it's important here to, to look that uh, the total numbers of the, the doses that are required for the AMC 
countries in the America is no more than the 1.4% of the total doses that these AMC countries are going to receive in the world. For the other side, in the self-financing countries, the 27 countries to are under self-financing countries represent more than 30% of the total number of doses that are under the COVAX facility for the self-financing countries. And now, like uh, South Africa and like Korea, we are waiting, or all the countries are waiting to receive the first doses through the COVAX facility. <coughs> but it's not the only the point to have the, vac the vaccine. It's necessary to have a very clear group map for the vaccination in the American countries. And principally take in consideration that the number of doses that we are going to have access is very, very, is a, a, a reduced number of doses. And with this roadmap, all the countries in the America are working to create a national plan. And the, the, the first point that the countries in the America are looking is the initial focus is the reduction of the morbidity and mortality you know, that, that we have here. The first goal of the vaccination in America is to save lives. The second goal or the next step is to reduce the transmission you know, and, and reduce the disruption of social and economical functions. But in, that, in this moment, with the short number of doses that we have, the focus is to save life. This is the reason that the majority of the countries in the America, <coughs> the focus is the vaccination in the elderly people, the vaccination in the health workers that there are in the first line of the, of the attention of COVID-19 pandemic and the vaccination of the adults with com comorbidities. But obviously this is part of the preparation that we have. One of the tools that we, that we are using in the America, but is using it in all the world, is this vaccine country readiness assessment tool that is auto-evaluation tool that the countries are using. In the America, we have the report in this moment for 33 countries that are using this uh, tool. And it's important to look here that uh, it's auto-evaluation, but the countries are looking what is the situation in each of these areas that is monitoring through the framework of COVAX vaccine, no? In, and uh, we are looking at this, and you can to see here how the countries in the America, this is the, the global picture of the countries in the America, we are in the pre preparation. <laughs> you can identify here, where is the challenges that, that, that we have. But it's important to look in this slide, what was the report in the, of the Virat in November? Uh, you can to see here that a lot of countries have in the category or, or, or not reported or not started yet the activities in, in a specific points. But this is the, re, the report now in February for the majority of the countries where the countries are complete the points or are in progress principally for this. In this link, you can to, 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 to go to this uh, uh, <coughs> uh, dashboard that we have in the America and you can to analyze country by country or the subregion, et cetera, et cetera, looking what is the situation of this. But the VIDAT is only to monitoring in general, but the countries are working in the national deployment and vaccination plan for this. <coughs> Since uh, July of the last year, PAHO uh, had uh, general guidelines for the countries uh, how to create the national plan for this. And obviously this is uh, in relation with the guidelines that is coming from WHO and, and UNICEF uh, for the guidelines in development, the national plans. And with this, we working with the country to have the micro planification plans uh, and taking consideration all these contents that we are looking here that, that you know, but it's important that the countries understand that the costing, for example, of this plan, of the human resources in this plan or the vaccination delivery strategies is not the same situation that we have for the regular plan. It's a different situation. Yes, it's an immunization program, but the immunization is not in the same target population. It's not in the same place that we apply the regular vaccination. It's not the same vaccine, and there are special conditions for this vaccine. And the context is necessary to understand that it is 
convenient to put more costs and more funding for the application of this. In the advance of the of the of the national plans, until today, WHO has this uh, partners platform where we are putting all the plans that we are create, the countries are in America are advancing. And uh, today we have 22 uh, national plans. 10 of them is the, the number of the AMC countries that uh, we have in America. And 12 is the uh, self-financing countries that uh, there are in the, in the COVAX <coughs> facility. But uh, which is the situation of the use of the vaccine in the America? Until today, 28 countries in the America are using, are introduced the vaccine uh, of COVID-19 uh, vaccine now. But it's important to be clearly, not United States, not Canada, but the other Latin America and the Caribbean countries that are under uh, COVID, uh, COVAX facility, none of these countries are receiving vaccine through COVAX yet. All the vaccine that they are applied in, the, in these countries is coming from the pro, uh, local production like United States or Brazil or, or bilateral agreements or donations that is coming for other countries. So the Caribbean countries, for example, receive an important uh, donation last week from India and they are apply this vaccine now. And, and the report of the number of doses in, in, uh, in uh, America countries it's uh, this, you can to see here, the number in the United States and the number in the other countries in the America. For the most important point here is what is the proportion of the population that may be covered with uh, at least one dosis of, of the vaccine. No? And, and obviously for the size of the population, like Cayman Island and Bermuda, Santur, San Caicos, it's important uh, uh, coverage that, that uh, we have now. But we hope that uh, in the uh, short time that we are going to receive or the countries are going to receive the vaccine that are coming from the COVAX facility, they can to improve this. It's convenient to understand that yes, we in America have a, uh, the countries in the America have a, a big experience in the introduction of new vaccines and the campaigns for elimination or the eradication in the vaccination and adults, people, no? Do you remember the, the elimination of rubella? We apply vaccine uh, adults in, in the America or the outbreaks of yellow fever. We apply vaccine in adults too. Or the situation of the vaccination of influenza, we apply in adults too. We have a, a, a lot of experience in this, but it's necessary to understand that the situation is different. It's not the same that the regular program. And all the countries in the America are, are, are working together to have uh, equal access at the vaccine and quickly access at the vaccine. But uh, the countries in the America understand that it's important to stop this pandemic, but at the same time, it's important to maintain the regular program of the vaccination uh, uh, of the vaccine preventable disease. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Laurie. Yes, thank you so much. Dr. Reyes Matisse, um, that was a really very informative presentation. Um, so we we have a little time to be able to have a discussion between our speakers. Uh, if there are questions you'd like to ask each other, if there's a topic that you find uh, uh, particularly compelling that you'd like to discuss. So is uh, anybody wanting to break the ice and start a conversation? All right, in that case, what I'm going to do is we've asked the audience to provide us with some questions. And one of the themes that keeps coming up, and it's probably understandable why it might, is the issue, and perhaps each of you can address this, and and, uh, and Jeremy, perhaps you could look at it from the global perspective. People are asking, when do we think that uh, herd immunity can be achieved either, either nationally, regionally, in the case of PAHO perhaps, or more importantly, globally, what timeline are we looking at? Are we looking at many, many years? What's your perspective?
I can start that if you want, um, but it'd be great to hear Shabir and, uh, and me and uh, um, uh, everybody's view on it. Um, I don't think herd immunity, it's a horrible phrase, uh, I don't think population immunity will be quite as straightforward as it is for some others. The new variants in Manaus, in Brazil and in South Africa, and indeed in the UK with the arrival of new variants, I think just gives us a warning. And I, I personally still feel, be interested in what the others think. I still think this virus has got quite a long way to go evolutionary. Um, you know, we're witnessing the emergence of a human pathogen uh, over the course of, you know, 18 months maybe or so, so far. Uh, I think from a biological perspective, it's got room to still evolve. And I think now we're adding an immune pressure to that from natural infection and vaccination. And so therefore, I, I don't think we've seen the final evolution of this virus yet. And I think we will see uh, further waves of this in, in the presence or absence of vaccination and natural immunity, uh, in fact. But I don't think that is uh, counter to the fact that if we do make sure there is equitable access to vaccines, they're rolled out globally to everybody that needs uh, them and wants to have it, that we can't achieve a degree of population immunity, which, as Shavir said earlier, is enough to allow lives to be saved, reducing hospitalization and taking pressure off health systems. Uh, I do not believe there's a zero COVID in, I don't think there will be a zero COVID. I think this is now a human endemic infection, but I think we can massively reduce the health impact of it uh, by reducing ho hospitalizations and deaths. And I think that's where vaccines may get us to, rather than thinking we're eliminating this infection any time in the next decades, actually. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. I mean, Mahdi? Probably chip. Yeah, so I mean, I fully agree with uh, Jeremy. I don't think, uh, at least for this first generation of vaccines, uh, that we would be able to bring about the total interruption in terms of chain of transmissions. Uh, I think the example from Israel probably is sort of the best case scenario, but it remains to be seen whether that interruption in terms of chains of transmission have, will be sustained, uh, especially when you have uh, these variants uh, being uh, distributed across the globe. Uh, so I think uh, given the context of what we're experiencing currently in South Africa, and like I mentioned, it's probably prevalent through most of Southern Africa, uh, the focus uh, needs to shift away from the notion that we're going to uh, get rid of the virus. Uh, I don't think that was going to be an option to start off with. And I think the bigger uh, danger that we face, in fact, is that in countries where there's high rates of circulation of the virus, coupled with the sluggish rollout of the vaccine, uh, we probably would experience even further variants evolving, uh, which are trying to, which are basically uh, evolving because of uh, the population immunity that's being induced by the vaccine. So I think that the sluggishness of the rollout of the vaccines might in fact itself become a problem in terms of uh, lending itself to evolution of other variants that are more specific to the vaccine induced immunity. So I really think that what we're really looking at right now is safeguarding of healthcare systems and uh, also uh, reducing death as has been pointed out, that needs to be the focus. But it also calls upon us, I believe, to recalibrate our response to COVID-19. I think the experience in PAHO in terms of the impact that COVID-19 restrictions has had on other health metrics, including immunization, childhood immunization services, is indicative of the problems that we're facing when we blindly decide to go into high levels of restriction without recognizing the collateral damage that's being done. And I think that collateral damage, to some extent, uh, might well far exceed uh, what the damage of COVID-19 is going to be. Uh, like I mentioned as well, uh, my, uh, at least from South Africa, in terms of looking at the infection mortality rate uh, based on the zero surveys, which, in, which indicated that up to 30% of uh, adults might have been infected during the course of the first wave, brings about an infection mortality rate in a region of about 0.08%, uh, uh, which is significantly lower that, than what has been observed in many high income countries. So I think we need to have a more critical appraisal in terms of the impact that COVID is having on the African continent in low middle income countries. And we really need to recalibrate our reaction to the COVID pandemic, our reaction to resurgences, as well as recalibrate our expectations of the first generation of COVID vaccines. Thank you. Right, uh, give, me, give me a chance to, to say, I, I agree with, with, with this point, but part of your question is that uh, we have to maintain the, 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 the 
population protection at the local level, national level, regional level, or global level to have impact in this, no? the, the herd immunity. I think that uh, like this, it's, it's a pandemic. We need to have a coverage in, uh, in the global level. It's not necessarily, it's not enough to have on the local or national level. It's necessary to, to cover a, a, a global level for, for, for this, you know, like, like uh, Jeremy said, this is, is an endemic, uh, uh, maybe endemic <clears throat> disease that we need to maintain the vaccination and the coverage. And obviously we have a, a lot of questions. What is the time of the protection of the vaccine? What is the, the effect of the variants? What happened with, we, we have a, a, a different platform. Not all the vaccines are going, are, is going, are going to work to, uh, the similar, no? Maybe some vaccines is for more long time. Maybe some vaccines need a booster, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that it's early to have answers for, for some question. It's, it's common to put into table, but uh, we don't have answers yet. Thank you. Dr. J? So obviously we cannot really eliminate this virus for a long time. Everyone agree, I think, um, most people. And the, uh, the target in, in my country is achieving uh, herd immunity, population immunity, whatever you call it. Um, 70%. So if you want to achieve 70%, um, maybe uh, because of the vaccine efficacy and also the, the with variant, um, with appearance of uh, variant, we should achieve a lot more than 70%. So the, our target is actually like 90% of popul the vaccinate 90% uh, of the population. And 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 then obviously if uh, we have um, the modified vaccine, then we will start uh, have to start again the, the vaccination. So, uh, but current uh, with current vaccines available, the, our target is uh, um, achieving uh, seventy percent um, of the coverage, not coverage the um, the um, efficacy. So that means a lot more. People should be vaccinated till until uh, within this year before um, influenza season starts. So that's our um, target, but I don't really know whether that can be achieved. So we are just uh, trying our best. Thank you. Sort of a sort of a related question that's come from the audience um, has to do with the fact that in South Korea is a good example of this. You have a number of vaccines that are in early phase one, phase two development at a time where we've had to truncate the clinical trials in the United States because with emergency use authorization of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, all the placebo recipients want to be immunized. So the question that's been posed is, um, what do you do in the context of existing vaccines in order to bring additional vaccines online? Can one look for licensure based perhaps on some sort of immune correlate to protection? Any thoughts on that question? Shabir, you, well, you think that is, Yeah, I'll can, can answer. Sure. Uh, so I think it's going to be difficult. Uh, I mean, uh, I think the experience, and again, I'm uh, going back to the South African experience, is one of which suggests that whilst uh, neutralizing antibody, uh, there might be an association between neutralizing antibody and ability to protect against mild to moderate infection, the same might not hold true for severe disease. And the immune mediators of protection against severe disease might vary. So it might well be that we basically can come to a color to protection for mild to moderate infection, but that might be too conservative uh, in terms of understanding what's required, or it might not be the correct uh, correlate in terms of understanding what's required to protect against severe disease. Uh, and then it really comes down to how, yeah, I guess it's a regulatory issue in terms of the approach that they would adopt when it comes to revolution of new variants. So I think uh, realistically speaking, that is probably the only option, even in a country such as South Africa, where we're facing these sort of challenges, the regulatory authority position has been one of which indicates that future trials uh, probably needs to include as a control group at the least a vaccine that has been shown to be effective, which in a sense almost rules out the placebo control trial. 
And that makes it highly difficult. I mean, the numbers that you would require for non-inferiority between vaccines would be massive uh, in excess of the 30,000 studies that are currently being done. Coupled with the reduction in terms of uh, the circulation of the virus itself will become problematic. So I don't. I think there isn't much other option than to aspire to getting to a quality protection. But like I said, my concern is uh, extrapolating from what is required to protect against severe disease in relation to what's probably required to protect against mild to moderate infection. Thank you. Other other thoughts on the question of how do we um, how do we develop new vaccines? Well, I, I agree with Javier on what he said there, but I, but I do think we need to challenge ourselves to think in the medium to long term how we're going to go about doing this, because I think we would all agree the first generation vaccines have been remarkable, but I do not think they will be the last generation of vaccines. Uh, I think there must be second generation vaccines. They're already being developed, if you like, against new variants. I also believe there'll be third generation vaccines maybe vaccines targeting mucosal services, maybe vaccines targeting longer protection, maybe vaccines targeted at certain ages of demographic. It's unusual for us to be vaccinating a whole population of all ages against uh, an illness. And I, I think we're gonna to have to learn of those surrogates of protection across all ages and demographics. Uh, so I do think we're gonna to have to find ways to assess second and certainly third generation vaccines. Uh, controversial, but actually I'm a, a very big supporter of, um, uh, of challenged human infection studies. Uh, and I think in the coming years, if not now, we'll be looking uh, to conduct human infection studies in a very controlled environment to try and understand more about the correlates of protection. Uh, and maybe that might be a pathway to future regulation. You know, it's interesting that you bring up human challenge. I had the conversation with a colleague just today about the question of uh, using human challenge studies to address the question of whether the vaccines actually protect against infection and not simply disease. Do you see a role for human challenge studies to answer that? Pretty important question. Yeah, I very much do. And there's huge controversy behind them. I accept all of that. And there's very strong uh, ethical issues that have to be addressed and safety issues. But transmission studies between such volunteers, I think, are very important. And also um, don't like to see these infection challenge models as just for vaccination. I think you can learn a huge amount from these studies uh, for diagnostics, uh, indeed for pharmacology of any treatment options, as well as understanding viral evolution. So I think there, there's a package of critical learnings to be gained from human infection studies if they can be done in a safe and ethically acceptable way. Well, I know both the US and, and the UK, there is a considerable enthusiasm in certain circles for human challenge studies, including one piece, as I recall, written by Stanley Plotkin. Um, and I know there were certainly volunteers signing up for such studies in the UK and the US. So um, it's, you're right, it's, it's a bit challenging. And um, although it would certainly be, as you suggest, uh, one way to find out quickly whether or not variants are, um, well, perhaps it's just easier to do neutralization studies rather than challenge in that regard. Um, so uh, another question, Ooh, yes, Dr. G. So obviously with the, our uh, ongoing trials for the uh, vaccines, which uh, Korean companies are developing phase one or two, uh, it will be very difficult to, to have clinical trial phase three in Korea because the number of cases is quite small. And also with the vaccination ongoing in other countries, it's extremely difficult. So really hope that there will be uh, the immune correlated pro uh, protection will be, will, can be will, uh, decided very soon that we, so probably we can just uh, uh, do the small number of uh, the people for the clinical trial, if that's possible, that would be great. But um, it's really challenging situation for those vaccines, quite obviously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so a, another question that came up was related to the safety data. Um, and um, the, um, 
the issue of I, many countries are collecting the data, and we, we heard from Dr. Messonnier a lot of detail around what's going on in the United States, but much of the data does not seem to be coming out to the public real time, and uh, the extent to which uh, we have a need for uh, data showing up almost on a daily basis, not only of the number of people being immunized, because we're seeing some of that data, although one is not certain how actually accurate that is, but more around the safety issues and dashboards like we would see where we know the number of new infections and new hospitalizations and new deaths. So are there thoughts with regard to the importance of having the safety data being rapidly publicly available? Hi, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Lawrence. In the case of the America and in particular the working that we are doing with the countries in Bajo, we have, we are going to launch and to present a, a regional system for the a, a study of uh, IFE. We are going to launch this uh, this Friday in this week, and uh, through this system, all the countries in the America are going to report the uh, IFE in the real time. No, and we have a, a the criteria that we are using with WHO, the criteria that we are using with the other partners, but principally it's an active uh, surveillance system that we have. It's not a passive uh, system. We have an active uh, system. And to understand that uh, it's, it's a, uh, you say that uh, there are uh, directly effect of the vaccine, but there are indirect effect of the vaccine. And we are looking for this now with, with the countries in America. We hope that in short time we have the data in the in the web of PAHO, with uh, with all the the rulers of the confidentiality, the 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 rulers of the of the person, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, the idea is to have this uh, in short time to take decision and to and to con and to give the evidence at the countries to take decision about the vaccination. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, we've, uh, we're approaching the end of our two hours. It's almost 2 p.m. here in New York. Uh, and so we're going to be closing down our very first session. We have a slide if uh, Jill or Noel could put the slide up. I, I really can't thank the speakers enough for, uh, for their presentations today. I think the, the talks were remarkable and the conversation discussion about some of the issues was really, uh, to me, very, very meaningful. Uh, so I want to thank this remarkable group of speakers for making the first session very exciting and both optimistic and concerning as we look uh, to inevitably providing the vaccine um, to achieve global control of the pandemic. So I hope we'll see you again tomorrow at noon New York uh, City time for a second session of the symposium. And again, I want to thank the uh, speakers, the audience, and all of the people shown on this slide. So everybody take care and stay safe. Bye.